Surya Kartika, good afternoon. And I think Laboni also said good afternoon, isn't it? Good afternoon to everyone. Okay, let me also tag in. How many of us are there? There are 11 of us, right? Okay, just wait for a minute or so, give time to people to join if they want to. So uh, yeah, I just want to tell those who are already here that I had sent, uh, so last class I had to go suddenly, you know, I had some technical problem and I had to leave suddenly. And I have sent the um, PowerPoint slides to the group, the WhatsApp group that we have. And I'm sure you can, the, there were just last one or two slides that had to be uh, discussed in class. But I think those are slides that you can read by yourself and you will be able to find out. Uh, and uh, one thing that I wanted to say about Tom Jones is uh, that uh, there is a question that you have to do for your assignments regarding Tom Jones, right? And how he uh, deals with distortions in human behavior. So that is something that we can discuss uh, later on as we come to the end of the classes, okay? Uh, but then I think uh, one of the group members today uh, has sent some helpful material also. So what you can do uh, is you can read all the helpful material. I've also been sending a lot of links and all that. So what you should do, what I suggest to all of you is that uh, you go through all the material and you understand the links that I'm sending are actually uh, pretty good links. Okay, I've been searching and sending. And you can take notes from that. I have sent uh, links regarding the uh, rise of the novel. Uh, and uh, that is a link uh, which is shared by all the IITs uh, in India. So it's a pretty good link and they cover the topic pretty well also. So you can take down notes from that also. And regarding the solved assignments that you're getting as helpful material, I, I I don't mind if you guys read all that, but when you submit your assignments, make sure that you do it in your own words. Okay, you can note down the important points that you get from all the helpful material and try to word it in your own words. Another important thing that I want to tell you know, all of you who are writing assignments is that uh, I, I, don't think that because this is English literature, you have to write tons and tons, and that is what brings you marks. It's not like that, okay? Uh, uh, in a way, it's almost like writing a science paper because there are points that you should be expressing, points that you should put in well-defined paragraphs, which are clearly readable and um, avoid, uh, you know, grammatical errors and stuff like that when you present. And don't make uh, the assignment uh, extremely long, okay? Sometimes it gets longer than the novel itself. So there is no need to do that, okay? So you just have to, uh, you, you just have to uh, make it sufficiently long to cover the important points that you have to say, okay? Uh, yeah, so uh, glad to hear that the notes uh, are becoming helpful. So carry on with that process, okay? Don't uh, just copy paste uh, some material that you find online and send it as assignment because the teachers who read it can immediately understand, okay? When it's not in your own words because we, we get so many repetitions of the same answer. So we immediately understand. So try to avoid doing that, okay? So uh, something which is presented without mistakes in a clear uh, manner, expressing all the important relevant points, okay? That is what will bring you good marks, okay? I'm saying that right at the outset. All right then, so today uh, the topic that we have to cover, by the way, I hope you all know that you've come for the MEG3 classes and we're going to do the second novel in uh, the session today. And the second novel that you all have to study is Pride and Prejudice, okay? Last class we started out with the rise of the novel and uh, uh, what were the reasons uh, that it came to prominence. And today we'll be actually continuing with that process. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about the novel, then we'll go into more details. And like I did last class also, 
I am going to share my screen with you, and I will be uh, talking with regard to the PowerPoints that I have. Okay. Give me one minute. I'm sharing my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, I mean, I, I've just opened it from my mail. So, some of the words might be, you know, just a bit misaligned here and there, but you have to bear with me, okay? All right. So, starting with Pride mm -hmm. and Prejudice, the novel that we're going to discuss today. MEDT. Uh, this is conducted by R.C. Koshi and I am Anita Mena, who is teaching. So you can see on the right side of the screen, there is a cover of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Now, we are coming to the 18th century. When we read Pride and Prejudice, the time that we are in is the 18th century. Now, this was also, as far as England is concerned, this was also a time of big social changes. Not only really England, I meant Europe, okay? big social changes and also politically uh, Europe was you know, uh, in a period of turmoil and unrest and uh, period after that was also kind of chaotic. So this is the time that we are going into. Now why was it uh, a time of political consciousness? Why was it a time of social consciousness? Let us see what was happening. Now peasants were beginning to move from rural estates to the towns. Okay. Increased trade was happening. Communication and travel was improved. Economic gains, uh, because when communication, travel, and increased trade happens, definitely economic gains will also be part of it, right? And also, this was the time when the Europeans were making several voyages to different parts of the world. That means they were getting into contact with different cultures also. So imperialism was on the rise. Uh, exposure to different cultures was happening and uh, peasants were also moving from uh, rural estates to the towns uh, because the land was uh, being uh, enclosed that means the uh, peasants could, did not have much future staying on in the villages and they were uh, going to the towns because that afforded them better chances of finding employment. So this was the uh, kind of period that we are going into. Okay. Now this was also a period of revolution. Okay. Uh, especially when we talk about revolution, one of the biggest revolutions that happened uh, around that time was the French Revolution. Now, why did the French Revolution happen? Okay. Uh, the the middle class people, you know, they were resenting paying a lot of taxes. You know, very expensive taxes which they could hardly afford to pay, and they were paying the taxes to kind of support the very expensive aristocracy that was ruling over France, especially in France, this was felt. Okay? So they, uh, the people, the common man, started, uh, started feeling very angry towards the aristocrats who were leading a life of extreme luxury, whereas they did not have enough even to buy food from day to day. So this uh, led to resentment, uh, especially for paying of the taxes. And that finally led to the uh, starting of the French Revolution in uh, 1789. And Pride and Prejudice was first published in 1813. So like very close to that. Okay. And the French Revolution actually began uh, when the Bastille was stormed. Okay. This was uh, said to be in history also when you read. Storming of the Bastille is said to be the beginning of the French Revolution. And Louis the Sixteenth, who was the ruler at that point, he was removed from the court at Versailles. Uh, Versailles was like a, a, a place which is almost decadent in the way in which they were living. Too much of luxury, too much of a life of ease and pleasure. So this was something that was quite a contrast to what the rest of uh, France was. Uh, going through. So that is why uh, first they stormed the Bastille, took hold of the prisons, uh, let the prisoners loose, and then all of them went to Versailles and 
Louis the Sixteenth was uh, taken from there, and the revolution moved through many radical phases towards the reign of terror in seventeen ninety three. Uh, so uh, a complete reign of terror, you know, so all the aristocrats one by one, the people were almost kind of getting out of hand. People were uh, killing. You know, executing the nobles one after the other. Uh, you might have heard of the guillotine. This was the time when the guillotine was used. The aristocrats, the French aristocrats, were dragged in front of the guillotine, and their necks were almost like a butcher's block. Their necks were put on the blocks, and it was a big blade would drop from uh, above their necks, and it, their head would be chopped off. This was how they were punished. Okay, so this was. Fast becoming going towards a reign of terror around 1793. This was called the reign of terror, and after that, Napoleon Bonaparte became the emperor. In 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte became the emperor. Now, uh, about the French Revolution, okay, this was uh, not something that happened only in France. This was, this had its repercussions. So its ripples spread all around Europe. In Britain also. Uh, it, it was very much uh, something that influenced uh, the thinkers, the philosophers, the politicians, the writers, the artists. All, all of these people were very much influenced by what was happening in France, especially as far as writers are concerned. Writers like Coleridge and Wordsworth, they were the first ones to be really uh, inspired by the French Revolution. In fact, Wordsworth even went to France to stay there to witness the French Revolution. But soon, you know, as soon as the French Revolution started, uh, it started with noble uh, ideals of equality, liberty, and fraternity. But it did not remain like that. Soon, it uh, it kind of uh, went into an anarchic mess of murder, of bloodshed. And that was when Wordsworth felt very disillusioned. Not, not only Wordsworth, many other writers like him also felt very disillusioned with what was really happening in the name of French Revolution versus what they had intended. So the, uh, that was also uh, part of what was happening. So th you need to know something about what was happening during the French Revolution. Now, in England, what was happening? See. It was one of the most violent periods in English history since the Civil War. Uh, the citizens' rights were repressed. There was a restriction on speech and assembly, like we had uh, during the lockdown, right? We were not allowed to assemble together, right? So but there were lots of restrictions in day-to-day -day life in England at that point, okay? Extremes of wealth and poverty. Fast growing population now, which was concentrated in the new industrial areas. Uh, they went to the industrial areas because they needed work to survive. And what happened as a result of a lot of people flooding to the industrial areas, this became an overpopulated area. Okay? And also, there was quite a division between the people who were very wealthy and people who were uh, quite below the poverty line. So then, uh, now one of the reasons why uh, the poor people accumulated in the urban areas was because the lands that they were farming in the countryside, in the rural countryside, got enclosed. So enclosure of land left them with no choice but to go look for jobs in uh, more uh, urbanized areas. Then mortality rates were very high in the congested cities. Uh, these cities were not uh, like anything that you imagine now. These cities were uh, actually uh, almost like slums, you could say. Okay, There was no sanitation. There was uh, no uh, concept of uh, any kind of you know uh, hygienic habits or anything. So uh, disease spread very fast and mortality rates were very High. In fact, the Paris of today was something that had to be rebuilt. You know, the city of Paris was one of the dirtiest cities. It had to be completely rebuilt at a certain point in time when everything was planned and the new city was kind of built. Uh, so uh, these were cities that were unbelievably uh, unhygienic and unsanitary. Uh, now, this... Uh, 
also was a time when modern capitalism was on the rise when industries uh, a lot of industries develop right when a lot of industries spring up this is also the time when capitalism uh, started becoming more and more uh, in vogue you know more people who owned the industries became the capitalists and this was a shift from british way of life which was primarily agrarian agrarian means people who make a living out of doing agriculture so from an agrarian economy this was shifting to something which was ruled by modern capitalism uh, ruled by something which became more and more industrialized and totally depended upon the market uh, and this was also the time of social changes questioning the very idea of society its civilizing force and its values okay so time when people started asking questions okay what is society what is civilization what are the values with which we live okay now this kind of questioning is what we call as the enlightenment period the enlightenment period is basically you know um, uh, something uh, a kind of thought process that happened because science was developing okay a, a missionary was developing this was kind of the time when more and more interest in science and reason and all these subjects were shown so uh, there came to be now a shift in belief systems from uh, divine things from a kind of a blind belief in what god dictated to a kind of belief in what reason dictated this is called as the enlightenment period okay can you see my heading is kind of lost there is it clear to you the heading uh, if you can't see properly uh, i put the heading the enlightenment okay i don't know how you see it on your screen ma'am it's visible okay all right the uh, a belief in reason as a defining characteristic of human being so this is basically what is enlightenment okay enlightenment period stressed upon reason as something that defined human beings now the renaissance humanist thinkers in italy in france in the 14th century argued that proper worship of god requires an admiration of his creation and especially of humanity as a crown of that creation so it's it's not just a blind admiration of god but the center of focus should be human beings themselves because uh, human beings consider themselves as a crown of creation right that humans are therefore not only created in the image of god but also share his creative power this is what they believed okay thinkers in italy and france around the 14th century they were called as a renaissance humanists renaissance means nascence is birth renaissance is rebirth so uh coming back to enlightenment see uh, reason in enlightenment usually refers to common sense powers of observation and deduction and also skepticism in thought which becomes a moral duty for human beings so these thinkers stressed upon these elements uh, that that means enlightenment which meant uh, more importance to reason which meant what does reason signify to these people see common sense powers of observation and deduction and skepticism skepticism we ask questions more right and we are skeptic about things we ask questions more and deduction you see something and from that you deduce you right you come to conclusions based on the examples that you have based on what you have observed so these were the uh, important things uh, as far as uh, reason was concerned during the enlightenment period now the kind of artwork that sprang up during the enlightenment period was uh, neo classic okay that is what is called as neo classic Uh, which was a, a shift from the highly ornamental rococo or uh, baroque style of art so uh, again going back to the enlightenment nature in the enlight in the enlightenment period is appropriated by different streams of thought okay enlightenment uh, uh, as uh, uh, as described uh, in terms of reason becomes nature and nature is something that uh was a, a stream of thought that spread to various other uh, subjects like ethics satire satire is 
uh, kind of uh, you know revealing the faults in society through humor it can be escaping humor or it can be lighter humor but using ridicule in order to point out the faults or the ills in society satire then science religion and politics and uh, neoclassicism that was a kind of art that sprang up as a result of this now it advocated the study of an imitation of classical writers neoclassicism and writers like D- dryden and pope and johnson emphasized the need for order and harmony as against human excesses so the, they looked for order they looked for harmony uh, uh, versus uh, as opposed to uh, romanticism which will come to later so enlightenment absolutes of re- uh, reason and good sense and nature and resulting human behavior are satirized by writers in the 18th century and jane austen is among them so uh, the uh, the writers during the enlightenment period gave too much of importance to reason too much of importance to good sense and too much of importance to what is nature and the resulting human behavior was uh, satirized by writers of the 18th century jane austen our writer is one of them who was making fun of uh, the kind of ideals followed by the followers of enlightenment and enlightenment has been criticized for fe- failing to live up to its ideals uh, because ideals were completely based on reason but it did not live up to its ideals and foucault foucault is a, a, a great a thinker a french thinker uh, important as far as structuralism and post structuralism is concerned that is part of your critical theory critical studies uh, and he said enlightenment this is what foucault uh, enlightenment meant for foucault yeah he said that see in, it includes elements of social transformation types of political institutions forms of knowledge projects of rationalization of knowledge and practices technological mutations and austin writes about this fast changing reality now going to the next uh, part see romantics or romanticism now from uh, the mid 18th to the mid 19th century okay it, that period it moves away from the scientific and cr- critical rationalism the rationalism that you found during the enlightenment period we we move away from that okay so uh, during the mid 18th century to the mid 19th century we move away from the scientific and critical rationalism and stress on nature as an ideal connecting it with imagination or fancy and subjectivity what is subjectivity what is subjectivity anyone can answer ma'am Hello. giving one's own uh, personal opinion about something yes Rep- representation of a self expression exactly exactly versus the uh, the other side of the coin is objective objective very good okay i have good listeners and good students very good that Thank is exactly you. what i meant so subjectivity where uh, the personal point of view comes into effect so uh, uh, the romantic period you know where uh, nature meant connecting with imagination or fancy and subjectivity which is completely opposed to the enlightenment ideals of reason then one of the defining traits of romanticism is the tendency to privilege individual experiences like your uh, your friend just mentioned individual experiences and expression over the collective or the social okay so individual experience is more important than the collective experience or the social experience and personal sensibility overrides categories of race and sex and class so this became more uh, more uh, centered on an individual in literature this means a strong emphasis on subjectivity on spontaneous expression and on the internalizing of all experience so everything becomes internalized how do i take it how do i find it right kind of internalized so this was uh, how uh, romanticism was reflected in literature individual centric internalized 
example uh, in this novel pride and prejudice we have the central character is elizabeth and uh, one of the examples that is given in your text is that of elizabeth and her personal prejudice causes her to think in a certain way about both wickham and darcy darcy is uh, the main character the hero in this novel and wickham can be said to be the opposite side of that okay He's almost a villain okay uh, so the way elizabeth perceives these two characters okay is a very personal prejudice is something which is very individualistic and final truth that emerges prevents the subjectivity from carriage to the extremes <clears throat> so uh, in the novel also we have a very good example of uh, uh, individual prejudices clashing over what could be uh, real reality and uh, uh, a fine balance is achieved because uh, elizabeth uh, understands her mistakes and corrects it all then uh, jane austen wrote during the romantic movement in literature but then she ridicule ridicules a lack of realism falsities of sentiment and lack of psychological veracity in the treatment of character in the novels of sensibility and gothic novels so the next novel that we will be studying wuthering heights is a gothic novel but uh, it, uh, jane austen bases her characters firmly in uh, realism in in realistic grounds and she in fact ridicules you know the novels of sensibility and gothic novels through her novel and she feels that they have a, a lack of psychological veracity in, in those characters okay veracity means truth okay psychological truth in the portrayal of those characters whereas her characters are very realistic that going on so we looked at enlightenment we looked at romanticism and then going on to the next one uh jane austen's uh novels you know they do not include magical miraculous or fantastic elements in her writing her characters are ordinary human beings instead of grand or heroic figures they are more realistic than romantic okay she can be called a romantic for certain reasons the first reason juxtaposition of inner and outer worlds in her characters the second one insistence of love on love and friendship as a basis for human community okay so uh, the thing about jane austen is that see she writes in a very realistic manner uh, as opposed to a fantastical kind of writing in in gothic fiction for example you might find somewhat a supernatural kind of elements in it but uh, jane austen's writing is not like that uh, ordinary human beings uh, are presented and no grand heroic figures are presented and these figures are uh, more realistic than romantic but then she can be called romantic in two way uh, two ways basically one is that uh, she puts together you know presents to us in contrast or in juxtaposition placing each side by side the inner world and the outer world of her characters and uh, one more thing is that she insists on love and friendship uh, as being something that is uh, that is a basis for human community so in those uh, in that sense she can be called a romantic also now jane austen uh, the heading next heading is that jane austen both romantic and august okay how is she like that now romanticism Uh, as we discussed earlier it was an artistic and literary movement in the late 18th and early 19th century english romantic literature was characterized by a love of nature distrust of reason so moving away from enlightenment distrust of reason rejection of traditional authority okay and the augustan age uh, it was in the 18th century in english literature and that has been that period is called the augustan age uh it's also called neoclassical age the age of reason so uh there are elements of both romantic and augustan uh, periods in the writing of jane austen okay i mean all these different ages are classified for uh, to help the student to understand you know different a uh, different periods in uh, literary history that doesn't mean that you know writers can be put into all these watertight compartments okay so you find both romantic and augustan elements in the writing of jane austen 
Now, uh, we have uh, also looked at what was romanticism, which was uh, something uh, characterized by love of nature, distrust of reason, and rejection of traditional authority. And uh, the Augustan age, uh, the literature that existed during the 18th century, it's also called the age of reason. Now, landed aristocracy, uh, which uh, was not in favor of assertion of personal identity, right? I mean, landed, uh, landed aristocracy uh, who wanted to say fold or hold on to their power and wealth, they were not in favor of in individual uh, identity being asserted by the people. Whereas uh, the rural gentry and the middle class tradesmen, professionals, etc., believed in freedom to the individual. So uh, there was a contrast between what the rich people wanted and what the common man wanted, right? Well, common man wanted uh, areas to express uh, themselves, whereas uh, the rich people did not want the common man to have their freedom. So, however, the individual freedom of women was still severely restricted. See? The change was happening as far as men were concerned. They were becoming aware that, you know, the common man at least was becoming more aware that he needed more freedom. He needed more uh, authority to voice his own opinions but whatever be the case okay the freedom of women it was still severely restricted even during that time woman was made, basically meant you know for marriage for childbearing taking care of the kitchen that was how it was conflicts between idealistic aspirations of the individual and the materialism of society and class interests also was part of this period okay so uh, uh, idealistic aspirations of the individual who was becoming more and more aware that he needed an area or he needed a venue to express himself versus the materialism of the society which was bent on making money, exploitation of the different classes. So that was also something that was happening in England at that point. Now Jane Austen uh, identified with the 18th century realism in Lowell. Uh, that is, the universal truths of the Augustan ideal, reason and good sense are stated in her text, but are then subjected to an ironic subversion. Subversion means it's reverted or a kind of uh, contradicted. It's reversed and contradicted. So that is uh, how you will find her expressing uh, the situation uh, or uh, the world around her at that point in time. So uh, reason and good sense is given importance, but then it is also subjected to an ironical uh, subversion. Uh, ironical in the sense you say something, but you mean something else. There is a, a shift uh, between what is intended and what what is really said. Okay, so that is a kind of irony there. Uh, irony is another um, another important word that you will have to learn. An irony can happen uh, in a work of literature uh, in terms of uh, verbal irony, in terms of situational irony. So uh, we, I will go into mo more of that uh, later on. Okay, But uh, irony is something which uh, where uh, like you say something, but uh, the opposite of that comes out. Okay, Then going to the next one. So... Uh, you have to understand that Jane Austen as a writer has elements of both the Romantic period and the Augustan period in her writing. Now we are coming to the life and works of uh, the writer, Jane Austen's life and works. Okay, now She was born on the 16th of December in 1775 at uh, Steventon in Hampshire. She was the seventh child of a uh, rector. Her father was uh, a rector in the church there. Uh, Reverend George Austin, uh, uh, George Austin, and she had a loving and a very lively family. She was very closely connected with her siblings, her sisters, and one brother they had. She was familiar with the world of minor landed gentry and the country clergy in the village and town with visits to Bath and London. So those days, uh, London was the big city, and Bath was the place where they went to uh, recoup their health. So many, uh, many uh, fashionable uh, people went to Bath in order to have a vacation there. So she was familiar. Uh, Jane Austen, the way she lived, she had gone to these places, had experienced this sort of life. So she was someone who 
Lesnar could write about minor landed gentry, the gentle folk, okay? not to be extremely rich, but the middle class kind of gentle folks. Uh, and she was very familiar with the way in which the country clergy operated in village and also in places like London. Clergy means people belonging to the church. So she used this in uh, the settings and characters and the subject matter of her novels. And uh, she published four novels during her lifetime, Sense and Sensibility, which was published in 1811, Pride and Prejudice, which was published in 1813, Mansfield Park in 1814 and Emma in 1815. Okay? And even when they were young, you know, all the sisters and brothers used to enjoy writing and spending time making up stories and writing, etc. Now, Pride and Prejudice describes the clash between Elizabeth Bennet, the daughter of a country gentleman, and Fitzwilliam Darcy, a rich aristocratic landowner. Okay? So this is what uh, basically the story is hmm? uh, a romantic story uh, it describes the clash between elizabeth bennett so she's our heroine okay and she's the daughter of a country gentleman called mr bennett and uh, darcy of fitzwilliam darcy that was his full name he was a rich and aristocratic land owner uh, who was also a, a pretty, uh, you know, terse in the way in which he used to speak and manages to offend and irritate Elizabeth when they meet for the first time. But gradually she understands that he is not the kind of person she thinks and she grows to love him. That is a whole story, pride and prejudice. Although Austin shows them intrigued by each other, she reverses the convention of first impressions, right? Uh, pride of rank and fortune and prejudice against the inferiority of the Bennett family holds Darcy alone. So both the, our hero and heroine, when they meet each other for the first time, do not fall head over heels in love, right? What do we normally say? Love at first sight, but it's not love at first sight for them, okay? Now, first impression when they meet, see, pride of rank and fortune and prejudice against the inferiority of the Bennett family holds Darcy aloof. So he, he remains kind of aloof from them because he thinks he's on a different social plane altogether. And Elizabeth is fired both by pride of self-respect and by prejudice against Darcy's snobbery. So Elizabeth is also, you know, full of, uh, I mean, her own uh, opinions. And she is also guilty of being very proud. Uh, and she is proud because she has a lot of self-respect. She does not want to bow down to uh, Darcy because just because he's rich and he's a gentleman. So a uh, pride of self-respect and uh, prejudice against Darcy's snobbery. The minute she thinks that Darcy is a snob, she brands him as a snob, okay? And there is a prejudice in her mind uh, against Darcy. So this is the way in which our hero and heroine actually meet. Then ultimately, they come together in love and self-understanding. The intelligent and high-spirited Elizabeth was Jane Austen's own favorite among all her hero heroines and is one of the most engaging in English literature. So about the character and about uh, her works, especially the work that we have to study. Now, going to the main themes in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, 18th century also witnesses the emergence of the new science of human psychology, where human experiences, ideas, feelings, emotions, and experiences in society began to be studied by physical scientists in their study of natural phenomena. Okay, so this, this was a time when human psychology uh, was uh, beginning to be studied. Uh, so the, the concentration, the limelight, or you can say the spotlight was on human beings and the psychologists started giving attention to human experiences, the ideas that we have, the emotions and feelings that human beings have and how do they interact in society. All of this was studied with new interest because this was the time uh, when psychology as a field of study was emerging. Uh, and uh, evolution of a concept of universal human uh, nature by thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, and Hume. 
so these were the thinkers who developed a sort of a hum universal human nature and human nature could be seen as consisting of some basic traits which combine in different proportions and combinations to form the personalities of different individuals this was how they uh, studied it at that point jane austen's treatment of pride a form of excessive self absorption self centeredness uh, and self regard or self esteem so uh, in the novels of jane austen you see how she uh, puts a spotlight on this emotion of pride okay how it becomes a sort of uh, you know self absorption pride comes uh, when when you have a concept of who you are right self absorbed excessive self absorption and self centeredness and self esteem and self regard right so this is who i am my pride comes from that right so that she she concentrates on that in her novel and uh, jane austen's treatment of pride uh, in the novel is manifested in two ways okay pride in mental or physical possessions also right uh, the characters they are intelligent and they are also good looking so this is the sort of pride that is manifested in her novels the uh, characters who uh, are uh, who feel that you know uh, they are above others so that sort of uh, emotion is tackled in the novel and this comes as a result of you know how hum universal human nature was uh, thought of uh, at that point in time by thinkers like hobbes and locke and hume in fact in your text you can find the quotations by few it would uh, be too simplistic now uh, given the fact that uh, jane austen is looking at pride the emotion of pride in her book it would be too simplistic to assume that darcy embodies pride and elizabeth embodies prejudice it's not as simple as that okay it soon becomes clear from the text that prejudice is largely considered as a consequence of pride reflected in the attitudes and behavior of both uh, behavior both of the person who represents pride and of those who react to it okay so uh, it, it's very clear from the text that you know prejudice is considered uh, as a consequence of pride right so uh, when there is pride uh, prejudice comes with that right see prejudice is considered as a consequence of pride reflected in the attitudes and behavior of behavior both of the person who represents pride and of those who react to it so uh, the proud person uh, thinks of himself or herself in a certain way and based on that they have a sort of prejudice against people who are not like that so prejudice is a result of the pride of characters who think in certain way and also of characters who react to it in a certain way so this is where uh, uh, that conflict comes okay so to think of uh, darcy as pride full of pride and elizabeth as full of prejudice would be a too simplistic way of looking at this whole question okay now going on further into that topic see pride relates more to our opinion of ourselves vanity to what we would have others think of us so pride is self esteem self regard right excessive absorption with the self and vanity is what we want others to think about us right when we dress well we want to be thought of as well dressed by others right that is vanity so different types of pride okay? a sense of dignity and self respect are present in one form of pride they are almost negligible in the other now darcy's excessive self esteem is pride of this kind while wickham's self regard is vanity so pride is also of different types right Uh, darcy is also very proud okay but his uh, pride is uh, something of self esteem where he knows he is this kind of person and he is not going to stoop any lower than that level now wickham is also kind of uh, you know vain okay uh, in the sense that he uh, his his self regard or his uh, sense of pride is more connected with vanity how people see him it's it's not like how he sees himself but how he presents kind of false image of himself to the 
people uh, who who he comes in contact with now pride is also manifested in various ways by different characters uh, in this novel okay for example the vanity of mr collins collins is the uh, cousin of elizabeth who comes uh, with hopes of marrying elizabeth uh, or the vanity of lady catherine de burg catherine lady catherine de burg is the aunt of darcy Uh, now she is also very uh, vain okay she doesn't treat uh, elizabeth properly then mrs bennet also has uh, mrs bennet that is elizabeth bennet's mother mrs bennet also has the sort of uh, pride uh, is pride in uh, her own uh, you know daughters she wants the, the ruling concern for mrs bennet is to get her five daughters married by the way i hope you are familiar with the characters of the novel right the, the novel is uh, set in uh, the countryside and there are uh, mr and mrs bennet and their five daughters and uh, the eldest is jane and the second daughter is elizabeth and jane uh, in, is kind of attracted to and kind of you know uh, almost uh, the troth to bingley another rich uh, aristocrat who comes Uh, to their village to live in his mansion uh, so jane and bingley uh, are almost a pair and uh, how society kind of puts in hurdle because uh, jane is not as rich as mr bingley uh, and elizabeth uh, who uh, me happens to meet darcy darcy who is a friend of mr bingley so this is how uh, the story progresses the tensions that happen between elizabeth and darcy and how finally they are reconciled to each other Uh, I will give you more uh, of the story as we go. Okay? Now, before that, we are talking about uh, pr- how pride is treated in the novel. Okay, pride is also manifested in different characters in different ways. Okay, uh, the vanity of Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins thinks that he is he is a low-ranking official in the church, but he thinks of himself in a big way, especially because he has a right to the inheritance of the Bingley's property. and he comes thinking that he can marry elizabeth but it does not work like that now uh, lady catherine de burg also uh, based on her social position uh, has a pride too much of pride in herself and mrs bennet also has a certain sort of certain sort of uh, pride but in the in that it's more connected with how she is able to marry off her daughters in order to achieve a sharper focus on pride certain characters are made to represent the quality op- opposite to it for its comparison and contrast this is something that writers always do including shakespeare you should say you know so characters if the heroes are presented in a certain light the villains will be presented in uh, in a sort of light which is completely in contrast to the glow of the uh, hero right so that the contrast becomes more obvious more uh, clear cut so here also uh, to to uh, give sharper focus on the pride of certain characters certain other characters are shown as uh, having the opposite characteristics of what is pride okay for the sake of comparison and contrast and uh, you can see there are two examples here darcy and elizabeth bennet represent different variants of pride and bingley and jane stand for modesty and candor both darcy and elizabeth are proud individuals okay and they have their own varieties of pride okay but both are very proud whereas contrast is in the pair of bingley and jay they are more modest and more frank with each other when there is too much of pride uh, one does not uh, want to bow down before the other right so that kind of leads to an absence of um communication also but that is not there in the case of bingley and jane they are a pair who are more modest and are more frank with each other now pride as selfishness pervades the social environment in pride and prejudice in so far as people's attitude towards each other depend on the benefit or gain that they can derive from them the example for that is wicked okay so pride uh, if you define pride as selfishness what i want for myself selfishness you can say that the ca- certain characters in pride and prejudice uh, behave uh, with an eye on what they can get with interaction 
through uh, this interaction to others. Uh, for example, Vikram. Uh, Vikram is a character who's introduced in the novel as uh, someone uh, who used to work for uh, Mr. Darcy's uh, house. Okay. Vikram's father used to work for Mr. Darcy's house. And uh, when Vikram meets Elizabeth, he tells her a story that makes Elizabeth uh, look at Darcy in a very uh, displeased way, okay? In a very uh, judgmental way, you can say. Now, Wickham tells Elizabeth that uh, Wickham's father was working for the estate of Darcy. And uh, after the father died, Darcy tried to get rid of Wickham from there so that he would not have to give him any money or land or property or anything. So this makes Elizabeth, you know, have uh, a bad impression about Darcy. So Wickham uh, is lying to her. But, and Wickham is having this sort of interaction uh, to get some sort of benefit from his interaction with these other people. Okay. So that is a kind of example uh, where pride acts as selfishness. Now, self-esteem. Uh, so pride is one thing. Now, self-esteem may make a character assertive like Elizabeth Bennet or eccentrically withdrawn like her character. So there is pride in uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennet that we have already discussed. Uh, so her pride is something that makes her more assertive. But uh, in contrast, uh, there is the pride that her father has. Okay? He's also a proud country gentleman. But his pride is uh, expressed in being withdrawn from everything that is happening around him. Kind of eccentrically withdrawn. He is never like part of, actively part of this whole, uh, whole drama to get his daughters married. Which his wife is very much, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, directing. So he is withdrawn from that. So self-esteem acts in two different ways. Example, one is the self-assertiveness of Elizabeth Bennet, and the other is the withdrawn aspect of her father's character. Now, snobbery may make a character superciliously non-community, like the Bingley sisters when they have to mix with people of inferior rank. So that is snobbery. That is what you call it, snobbery, because the Bingley sisters, uh, coming from an upper uh, class in society who are very rich, uh, who have a large mansion where they live. So when they mix with people of inferior rank, they show non-communicative uh, behavior. So that is uh, really expressing their snobbish behavior. So snobbery examples are the Bingley sisters, okay? refusing to communicate or mix and mingle with people of inferior rank. It may make them officiously patronizing, domineering, and rude, like Catherine Deeper. So pride is also something that can make people very domineering and rude, outright rude, okay, like Catherine Deeper, the aunt of Darcy. So she behaves very rudely to Elizabeth when she meets uh, her. Then pride in the form of vanity, which is often a combination of selfishness and self-centeredness, can make a person pompous like Mr. Collins, silly like uh, Sir William Lucas, giddily talkative and insensitive uh, like Lydia or fretful like Kitty. So these are all examples. Again, pride in the form of vanity or different forms of pride, right? Whether it is self-esteem, whether it is snobbery, whether it is vanity. So... Uh, Especially in the case of vanity, see, the characters like Mr. Collins, William Lucas, and um, Elizabeth's sisters, Libby and Kitty, they are, are all uh, uh, different uh, versions of this, uh, you know, the form of pride called vanity. Now, these forms of pride are demonstrated both through dialogue and authorial comment. Okay, so both through the words of the author and also through dialogue. That is how we learn about characters, isn't it? In any book, in any book of literature, right? Whether it's fiction or play or whatever that you're reading, okay? Uh, how do you understand about a character? When you read their dialogue, when you read how the narrator tells us about these characters, right? So that is how we come to assess or analyze a character. 
the title Jane Austen gave to the first draft of the novel was First Impressions. The novel highlights unreliability of first impressions, even those of intelligent and observant people like Elizabeth and Darcy. So first impressions are not the best impressions, right? So uh, basically, this novel tells us about the unreliability of first impressions. Because the first impressions that Elizabeth and Darcy had of each other becomes completely transformed towards the end of the novel. And then, on account of his prejudices, which is again rooted in pride, Darcy offends the ladies assembled at Meryton Ball by not paying their attention. So he is uh, prejudiced against people from the village, right? So they are staying in this place called Meryton and they host a big party, a ball, where ladies and gentlemen dance with each other. But Darcy refrains from dancing with the village girls there. And he kind of, you know, uh, he, he kind of offends the ladies of that village by not uh, taking part in the dance. And his uh, staying away from the dance was based in his prejudices. Now, even Elizabeth is dismissed by him with a casual remark to the effect that she was tolerable, but not attractive enough to make him want to dance with her. So this was a very, like, you know, degrading way of uh, presenting himself at, at the beginning, at the first uh, moment itself, right? So Darcy refrains from dancing with the girls during the ball. And especially even Elizabeth herself, you know, she is dismissed by him by saying that, okay, she's kind of tolerable. It means she's somewhat beautiful, but not so beautiful enough to make me interested in wanting to dance with her. So naturally, this would make anyone angry, right? The girls would definitely be offended by his behavior. Now, Elizabeth's hurt vanity similarly distorts her judgment of the characters of Wickham as well as Darcy, something she acknowledges later saying, how humiliating is this discovery, but vanity, not love, has been my fault. So uh, Elizabeth being intelligent, she is able to understand her faults and correct it, especially if she understands how Wickham was lying to her and Darcy, although he was being very rude, was telling her the truth. And she corrects herself and she, this is what she says, how humiliating is this discovery, you know, but vanity and not love has been my fault. So I became, I acted foolishly because of my vanity. Are you guys with me? Can you, hello, can you all hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma can you? Okay. Good. Important incidents in the novel preceded by some rumor, gossip, obscuring true version of things. This emphasizes the need for a disinterested analysis of what comes to us through hearsay. Another aspect of this novel, you know, we hear a lot of things through uh, society gossip in this novel. Okay, And uh, it kind of covers up, uh, especially, for example, the way Wickham presents himself and uh, what they think about Wickham and what he is in reality, right? So it is something quite uh, different. The true version is something which is quite different. So this seems to stress, you know, like we told, uh, we discussed earlier how Jane Austen was satirizing the uh, society at that point, uh, at that time, right? So uh, through this, you know, through how uh, hearsay and rumor can often mislead people, she seems to be emphasizing the need for a disinterested analysis of what comes to us through hearsay. Hearsay is rumor again. You know, you hear something and report it to someone and they carry it forward. That is hearsay. Pure rumor, which is not based on facts. So Jane Austen seems to be saying, language is a tangled web. Subjective coloring it acquires under the interests of individuals and groups, which is uh, one meaning of pride or vanity in the novel has to be recognized and examined to get to the truth, right? This is, you know, the, the era, the age in which we are living today, uh, the age of WhatsApp forwards and fake news, right? This is called the post-truth era, okay? How do we analyze, right? We, we have like, okay, such a lot of fake news being circulated. 
this is kind of the same thing that Jane Austen is saying here. See, language is a tangled web. Uh, where subjective coloring, like I twist facts to suit me, that is subjective coloring. It acquires under the interests of individuals and groups, which is one meaning of pride or vanity in the novel. Okay, this has to be recognized and examined in a disinterested manner, in an objective manner, as opposed to the subjective manner, in order to get the truth. Okay, so this is uh, an important point there. Then this truth is, importantly, valid for the entire community or society. That is to say, it's not a subjective truth. Okay? So this truth can only be verified in an objective way. So uh, what she's trying to say is that don't listen to hearsay, don't listen to rumors and the web of you know lies and gossip, but rely on a truth which can be verified. Then coming to the next topic, which is again, I'm, all these topics and points are taken from your study material. Okay, then, love and marriage. I don't know. Can you see marriage written there in the title? Oh, On my screen, I cannot see. That. No, ma'am. Uh, no, ma'am. Yeah, no, ma it, you know, it is love and marriage. Okay, the, I don't know where the marriage went. Uh, but I'm not able to fix it, you know. Uh, but it is supposed to be love and marriage, okay? Just note it, huh? if you're taking down notes or something anywhere, the, this topic, uh, the title is love and marriage. Now we're going to analyze how marriage was at that point, okay? How it used to be at that time. Marriage is analyzed on two levels in terms of external obstacles like patriarchy and property relation and in terms of the character's personal attributes. I think it's true for us even today, right? We can look at the analogy of property, all of these things will come up. But personal attributes are no property, are no, and then another question very late. I don't know, I'll do I, I, oh, okay. Let me put that in English for those who do not know English. Let's see, uh, look. Marriage can be analyzed on two different uh, levels. One is the external ob uh, obstacles, the hindrances like patriarchy, you know, the father deciding, you know, who should marry and how they should marry, etc. Uh, question of inheritance, property relations, and in terms of our personal choices, characters, personal attributes. Now, pride, most harmful of such attributes, since it has to be overcome by a process of self-education before love can culminate in marriage. So, uh, this, this pride or a kind of uh, obsession with self-esteem that a character has uh, can mislead, right? Like we have already discussed how Elizabeth was misled by her pride. So, this can be overcome only by self-education, understanding what is the correct uh, thing there, right? Uh, not relying on uh, rumor mills and uh, webs of gossip or anything like that, but rather relying on self-education through verifiable truths, right? Now, only through that can you uh, can one get a true understanding of oneself, and only then can love culminate in marriage. In the 18th century novels, where love was a dominant theme. Uh, it was very popular. Okay? Love was a dominant theme, uh, popular in the 18th century. And it was, uh, love was not shown in isolation from other emotions and urges, but had to grow and develop by countering their presence. So uh, love didn't happen overnight. It was something that had to be worked upon. The novel of sensibility uh, followed in the second half of the 18th century. <clears throat> A noble aspirations of the lovers versus the crudely materialistic and manipulated social environment. So uh, the path of true love never did run smooth. You might have heard of the quotation, right? So noble aspirations of the lovers versus uh, what is very materialistic and crude and manipulative uh, as far as the society is concerned. Uh, there was always a conflict there. Then going on to the next part. Renaissance period, that is 15th century to early 17th century and post-Renaissance society after that period, okay, post-Renaissance society. 
marriage became a union between two individuals which signified the sanctity intensity and persistent strength of their love and an institution which fitted them appropriately into prevailing social hierarchies so marriage in that sense was something like you know uh, putting people into kind of pre pre arranged slots right Uh, a prevailing social hierarchy so people from a certain section and society would marry people from the same class there was nothing that would go below that or above that so this kind of you know marriage became like an institution which was uh, fitting them into pre conceived social system social hierarchies okay 18th century novels started questioning this attitude exploring the assertion of an individual autonomy so uh, marriages that started happening cross classes cross uh, different uh, levels in society so that was something that was questioning this attitude of pre ordained social class and hierarchies while married or while choosing a partner for Uh, particularly acute was a case of women who were not given full status of independent sensitive and rational human beings nor given equality in property rights and economic opportunities especially women you know they were quite at the disadvantage as far as marriage was concerned why see they did not have status of independent citizens they did not have uh, the status of rational human beings uh they did not have equal rights as far as succession is concerned as far as economic opportunities is concerned right even now the battle is still going on for women to get paid as much as men right so these things existed then also at that uh, time also the cultural climate of english society after french revolution and war between england and france made the social groups extremely distrustful of the radical politics implicit in the free i ideal of freedom and dignity of the individual so this was a time after the french revolution uh, where the common man had overridden and um, a lot of barbarism and bloodshed and all of that had happened so people from the capitalistic set or people uh, from the upper uh, classes were very much distrustful of people from lower classes so this kind of you know so marrying into a different class entailed uh, you know like admitting someone from a different point of view from a different perspective into their uh, uh, class so this was something that was looked upon with a lot of distrust okay and uh, that is why you know this was quite a, a revolution questioning the politics which was implicit in uh, fitting people into uh, already existing social hierarchies then the dilemma was resolved by muting down political dimension of the ideal of individual autonomy but greater intensity in the sphere of personal relationships so uh, the political dimension of the ideal of individual autonomy okay was quieted down or muted down to give more importance in the sphere of personal relationships as far as politics was concerned ideal of the individual autonomy uh, was kind of muted down to give more importance to how personal relationships were uh, looked at and maintained now examples here the love between elizabeth and darcy as a mode of affirmation of their autonomy as individuals depiction of love between jane and bingley a typical uh, cynical attitude towards women as mere objects of pleasure or as the route to instant prosperity is brought out example wickham so wickham uh, marries so that he can get money uh, so when the man married he would inherit all the property that the woman brings into the marriage so this is uh, wickham's example is the best example of uh, looking at women as mere objects or like a quick path to getting more money austen portrays also the materialism and economic individualism of the upcoming middle classes she shows the love relationship slowly gaining strength and maturity so people were beginning to think that you know 
love between two people, two partners, is more important than money or other materialistic concerns. So uh, Austin is uh, trying to show that you know there was uh, a small shift in the way people were looking at marriage uh, that was happening, and that is shown in the way in which Elizabeth and Darcy marry, or even Bindi and Jane. Uh, varied forms of love relationships in the novel. Uh, dullness and pomposity of Mr. Collins. Okay, Mr. Collins, who's the uh, who's one of uh, someone related to Mr. Bingley, and who comes. I told you earlier, he comes there uh, in hopes of marrying one of the Bingley daughters because uh, there was a rule uh, there uh, in existence at that time, uh, whereby. The daughters would not be able to inherit the father's property, and it would go to the next uh, male uh, heir who would take the father's property. So Mr. Collins happened to be that man. So um, he comes, you know, very pompous and full of himself, thinking of marrying. Although he's, and he wants to marry Elizabeth, who's quite, uh, you know, diametrically opposite to him. She's very intelligent, bright, and witty. And he is uh, described as dull and pompous. Then, uh, obtrusively meddlesome and domineering behavior of Lady Catherine. So, Lady Catherine embodying this, you know, upper class snobbish uh, people who especially do not want anyone from any other uh, class of society to come into their groove. So, she meddles in the uh, life of Elizabeth and Darcy. Then, supercilious finickiness of the Bingley sisters. The Bingley sisters also another example of how they meddle in the uh, love relationship between Bingley and Jane and try to thwart it, try to uh, end it. Then, Mrs. Bennet's obsessive concern for the marriage of her daughters is based on the presumption that daughters are perishable commodities to be disposed of quickly before their market value goes down. Sadly, you know, it this happens even now, right? I mean, Mrs. Bingley is quite worried for her daughters. They're growing older. And the older a girl gets, the more difficult it becomes for her to get a man. That was how they thought at that time. Okay? I, I mean, there are people who think like that even today. Although I cannot say that is the same situation now. But people still do think like that, right? I mean... So um, Mrs. Bennett wants to, you know, she's very worried, especially because of the rules of inheritance that were in existence at that time. She's very worried about getting her daughters marri married before, like as perishable commodities, as um, their value goes down, she want, doesn't want that to happen. So that is her concern. Then uh, uh, going on to uh, the love relationships here. See, Elizabeth and Darcy represent an actively assertive form of ind independence and critical intelligence. The secondary emphasis falls on James and Bingley's candor and goodwill. Like I mentioned earlier, we have two pairs, and these two pairs are quite different from each other, right? Elizabeth and Darcy uh, are a pair who are very independent and also pretty uh, critically intelligent. They have this analytic power, and they use it also. Whereas uh, Jane and Bingley are more, uh, you know, go people with a lot of goodwill in their heart and a lot of frankness in expressing that with each other. So Jane Austen's treatment of love and marriage is based on possibilities available within the limits of the existing social order. So she follows the social order, but still how it can uh, be changed. And also she kind of uh, illustrates and her challenge to class-based snobbery and patriarchy and bourgeois attitude has to be viewed in this perspective. So as far as love and relationships are concerned. Now going to the next topic here, women, okay, W-O-M-E-N, okay, it is there in the slides, but I don't know, it's not showing in my slide right now. Women, okay, that is a title there. Uh, the first point there, see, social position. Uh, restricted women's rights to own property and to run business concerns. In pre-industrial Europe, women contributed substantially to economies, but they could not occupy an equivalent position in the new urban and market economies. So in the uh, 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 
pre industrial area you know pre industrial uh, era sorry pre industrial era women uh, could contribute to economies because uh, they could work in the farms and actually contribute to the economies but in uh, a, a new urban setting in a new uh, industrialized setting where uh, you know the labor uh, consisted uh, more of you know importance being given to male laborers so in such a situation uh, women could not have the same power as a man had and uh, even as far as education and accomplishments are concerned uh, in persuasion uh, another one of her novels uh, and says and uh, and is a character in that novel okay men have had every advantage of us in telling their story education has been theirs in so much uh, higher a degree the pen has been in their hands so uh, women writing even women holding the pen to write was something uh, not really happening so much in those days yeah, mostly if you talk about any area okay uh, whether it is writing whether it is uh, politics whether it is science or traveling all of these things were mostly in the hands of men so uh, the character called anne in persuasion you know this is her quote there men have had every advantage of us in telling their story education has been theirs in so much higher a degree the pen has been in their hands right and and the hand that holds a pen is really strong right have you heard of this um, quotation the pen is mightier than the sword right so men were the people who wielded all the power and women were never on equal terms with them the absence of state supported education now look at the practical reasons here the absence of state supported education though the word local charity schools that was not enough in jane austen's time denied education to women i mean uh, uh, like uh, until like maybe 40 or 50 uh, yeah i think like maybe around 60 years back also Uh, women could go to uh, universities like oxford and um, places like that and sit with the male students uh, to listen to lectures and attend the classes etc but they were not allowed to take the examination and earn their degrees so uh, all of these things were happening until even quite recently right so you can imagine how women were at this uh, time you know when jane austen was uh, writing so there was no state supported educational system for women and uh, grammar schools were there uh, uh, you might have heard of how shakespeare went to grammar school the only education that shakespeare had was going to grammar schools but then even grammar schools were denied to girls see grammar schools existed to teach upper class boys and did not admit girls so most girls were simply taught at home by masters or governesses and they're not allowed to and that too only the rich girls okay mind you others could not even imagine uh, affording a master or a governor and they're not allowed to uh, allowed into either the public schools like eton or the universities of oxford and cambridge so girls were generally denied education now they were barred from any knowledge of the classical languages greek and latin and also of history political thought philosophy and other branches of learning instead what were they taught they were taught accomplishments like needlework drawing singing playing the piano which were needed because these were skills that would bring them a good husband okay this was the kind of education that women were allowed to have in pride and prejudice there are a number of scenes where women have to display their accomplishments in a social situation Uh, Bingley ex- expresses surprise at the number of skills young ladies are expected to possess. They include painting, ta- painting, uh, painting tables, covering screens, uh, you know, using needlework, netting purses, singing, dancing, drawing, and an acquaintance with the modern languages. And uh, Darcy adds to this list by saying that a woman ought to be. well read also so uh, the men you know who that who they were 
uh, wanting to marry they had high expectations of the girls yet the situation that the government or the state provided for the girls to get truly educated was next to nothing okay no government uh, aided uh, institutions allowed the women to study admitted the women into universities nothing all the education that was expected of them were these you know homely uh, skills like singing and sewing and play, playing the piano and all all of these things which were aimed at to get good husband this was the situation of women at that time now coming again to another important point in the novel the question of money and property uh income most women had no independent means of income and were completely dependent on their fathers brothers or husbands that is itself you know such a limiting thing right if you don't have an income of your own you will definitely always have to ask someone whether it is a father or brother or husband and professions were close to women as was politics so not only did they have no money of their own and were dependent on their close relatives uh, they were also barred from following any profession in order to make money they were barred from following any profession also politics also was close to them few occupations are open to women was to be a governess you know they could stay uh, as a private tutor in the homes of these gentlemen and governesses were not even treated well okay they were treated as cheap labor actually so it brought poor pay miserable social conditions and not much respect this was the way that women were uh, if at all allowed to work this was the way in which they were allowed to work okay uh, jobs that did not give them respect did not give them good pay the only real way for a woman to get money if she had not inherited it was to marry for so a marriage became like you know a kind of thing whereby a woman could find some sort of security for herself if she was not a rich woman already the only way in which she could have some money for herself was through marriage unmarried women uh, were not even allowed to live by themselves they had to live with their families and living with their families they often uh, lost a sense of who they were as individuals right they had to probably you know take care of other other people's children and things like that and they lost their individuality then so uh, money and property first thing is about income right many women were denied the right to have income of their own settlements uh, a legal document intended to ensure that the property which a woman brings to marriage will ultimately belong to her and after her to her children usually the wife may not have personal control over her money during her marriage okay uh, so uh, there were legal documents that were intended to ensure that if a woman was rich and had property of her own right it will uh, it will ultimately belong to her and after her to her children so uh, <clears throat> those were called settlements okay sometimes there were settlements but usually uh, a, a wife did not have control over uh, her own settlements this was dealt with by the husband uh, for example 5000 pounds which are settled by marriage articles on mrs bennet and the children and out of which mr bennet has to give lydia her share as part of the marital agreement settled upon with wickham it highlights the fact that marriage often had economic basis and also aspects of monetary gain so this is what uh, is the basis you know of marriage also money money is the basis there and even if the woman did have money and a settlement of her own she most often had no control over it uh the example that is given of you know ma ma marriage uh, as a basis for economic uh, gain or monetary gain example is wickham's refusal to marry lydia he runs away with her but then uh, when the family wants to give a respectable uh, note to their relationship wickham demands for money and the family has no way but to give him what he asks 
So Vikram refuses to marry Lydia without a settlement that promises him some financial and professional uh, freedom. So this is uh, an example of how money and property was at that time. Then entails and inheritance, another important topic here. See, an entail is a legal device which is used to prevent a landed property from being broken up or from descending into a female life. Property was inherited by sons. Okay, women were not, the daughters were not allowed to inherit property. Uh, as far as possible, they would try to, uh, you know, keep it with a male life. So uh, they had something called an entail for that, entailment. Okay, uh, it's, it's a legal device. Uh, so that pro property, inherited property, would go to the male line, not the female line. Okay? If the head of the family dies without sons and the estate is inherited equally by all the daughters, this leads inevitably to subdivision. And if it is inherited by a single daughter, it becomes part of the estate of her husband's family. Neither possibility was a desirable one. Right? So, see... For example, Elizabeth's father, okay, he had five daughters. He does not have sons, right? So if the head of the family dies without sons, the estate is inherited equally by all daughters, which leads to subdivision. And that they did not want. They tried to prevent it. And suppose it was inherited by a single daughter. What happened is that she did not have any control over her property. This will become part of her husband's family estate. So see, this, both of these possibilities were not desirable ones. Right? Now they, therefore, had another rule to you know, kind of take care of the situation. Primogeniture, that is called primogeniture. It is therefore extended to the entire male life and not just to the sons of the holder of the estate. And which is what entitles Mr. Collins, a cousin of the Bennett sisters, to eventually inherit the Bennett estate. So whatever money Mr. Bennett has, his daughters will not inherit it. It is the next successor in the main line, which happens to be Mr. Collins. He is the one who will be inheriting the Bennett estate. Behind Mrs. Bennett's constantly expressed dissatisfaction at and incomprehension of this state of affairs. Okay, uh, it's not just greed. You know, Mrs. Bennett is always crying about the fact that. She and her daughters uh, will not uh, get anything uh, and they are very uh, economically insecure if anything happens to Mr. Bennett. Now at the uh, base, at the root of this dissatisfaction is the real fear you know, of what will happen to her and her daughters uh, in the event of Mr. Bennett's death. And that is why she is hurrying, she is trying her best to get her daughters married so that they will not have to face this uh, sort of, you know, insecurity of where they will go, what will happen to them and their house and their property. So the, this is one of the reasons, you know, how we can explain Mrs. Bennett, uh, Bennett hurrying up to try to get her daughters married. Now, Pride and Prejudice explores Austin's views on the negative aspects of primogeniture. So this is, a, a, you know, you we really realize the predicament that they are in when we, when we read Pride and Prejudice. So we can say that primogeniture, which was a rule that existed uh, at that time, it had negative influences and which, which is what we can see through this novel. So the Bennett sisters are forced to find themselves husbands or rely on relatives to live uh, after the eventual death of Mr. Bennett. They will have to go from their home, from their land, from their property, because Mr. Collins would be inheriting that. So that was a very difficult situation for the girls. The next topic, marriage, okay, M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E. I don't know, the G and E is missing from my slide, uh, but please make a note, it is marriage, the title. Now, I'm going to start with the reading of a quote, okay, from Jane Austen in a letter March the 13th, 1816. Uh, single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is one very strong argument in favor of matrimony. So single women who want to remain single, but even if they want to remain single, they find it very hard to survive because 
they are uh, they quite obviously almost certainly going to be extremely poor and in order to get rid of this uh, propensity for being poor for this likelihood of being poor they try to find a solution by getting married so this was the choice uh, that was given to them uh, was it really a choice you think it was really a choice anyone there or am i speaking to myself no ma'am okay are you all there are you listening what is it do you think it's a choice as girls what yes, do we yes, see listening is you it a choice no ma'am it's not a choice right it's it's absolutely not a choice right so i mean the options should not be that a single woman will be poor and in order to get rid of poverty she has to marry that should not be a choice right women should be given the right to freedom of uh, exercising their likes and uh, dislikes the right to education the right to follow a prof profession and the right to own their livelihood all of these things were denied to women during jane austen's time then marriage was usually the only means of social mobility for women most middle class women had to save enough money for their own dowries so see they had to uh, additionally they also had to give dowries and if they did Mother not have an God. inheritance they had to work and save money to make their own dowries so marriage was almost always for life divorce also was not allowed okay divorce was possible only in the event that the sexual infidelity of the wife could be proved sexual infidelity of the husband was not important okay Uh, and even here the husband had to get permission from parliament to sue for divorce legal separation neither party could remarry in this case uh, was possible on grounds of cruelty but the husband was usually granted exclusive custody of the children in such cases and could prevent the wife from seeing them a legal separation was something that could be allowed but then you had to prove that there was domestic violence okay on grounds of domestic uh, violence Uh, husband was usually granted exclusive custody of the children and the mother could not see her children so that was also again not in favor of women a rule or a law that was not in favor of women now heiresses were in danger of being married for their money uh, women with a lot of inheritance they were in danger of being married for their money alone by fortune hunters example they can the reality of marriage for most women in this period also meant repeated childbirth with the attendant physical discomfort followed by years spent in child rearing so they had no uh, no control over over uh, the number of children that they would have to give birth to so that means the woman uh, in order to escape penury in order to escape poverty most likely would have to get into marriage and getting into marriage meant getting into child bearing giving birth to children one after the other for years and years of their life because many of them had several children right like me like maybe 10 even so can you imagine like almost 10 plus years of their life spent in giving birth to children and taking care of their children so that was also something which was not uh, exactly you know convenient for the woman right marriage often shown as conventional ending in fiction the other is death okay provides a sense of closure and makes it possible to bring together the themes and depiction of private and public life so marriage was shown mostly in novels as an ending or uh, the other ending that is usually shown as like you know uh, tying all the loose ends together is death so uh, in pride and prejudice the satirical view on marriage is presented by jane austen okay? she clearly brings out how a single woman uh, has to go through so many difficulties in order to survive and how marriage is not an answer then looking at the characters in the novel okay 18th century debates whether individual character traits are inherent or formed by education and upbringing and if it is inborn whether or not they are alterable okay so this was the time uh, then uh, 
individual character traits you know they they were debating upon the question of nature versus nurture right so are they naturally born with these traits or can education and can nurture actually bring about a change in human traits foster in aspects of the novel provides the term flat and round for character a flat character is one who does not change in the course of the fiction and a round character is one who changes and develops as the story or the play progresses okay so flat character remains static remains the same from the beginning to the end you do not find any uh, development in uh, the character okay in, in the nature of the character whereas a round character or a dynamic character is one who changes develops learns from what happens and uh, goes from there you know so the as the story or the play progresses you find uh, dynamic characters changing or you find round characters changing then the comic characters mrs bennet mary bennet mr collins sir william lucas and lady catherine de burg are all flat and static elizabeth and darcy are examples of round or dynamic characters who understand their mistakes and work on it to improve themselves so they are dynamic characters then characters in jane austen's fiction uh, is constituted by the particular decisions and actions which he or she undertakes or as a case may be fails to undertake the bennets so these are the characters here the bennets mr bennet mrs bennet then the daughters jane elizabeth mary kitty and lydia uh, bingley's bingley is there uh, carolyn his sister is there and luisa hers is there okay Darcy's Lady and Darcy, uh, Darcy and Georgiana. Georgiana is Darcy's sister. Then the other character in the novel is Wickham, and there is Mr. Collins, the cousins of uh, Jane and Elizabeth. Then there is Lady Catherine and her daughter Anne de Bourgh. So these are the uh, characters in the novel. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Bennet function to bring out the debate over the role of upbringing in character formation. so is nature versus nature mrs uh, bennet the uh, bennet girls you know uh, i clearly show uh, what is important okay what the role of character formation uh, of their five daughters two are shown to have inherited their father's good sense two to have demonstrably taken after their mother's silliness and one to have more or less formed herself through pedantry as opposed to real learning so five daughters jane and elizabeth have taken after their father uh, are more intelligent and the other two girls that is mary and kitty are more like their mother more given to silliness uh, and uh, kind of not as deep uh, as jane and elizabeth and the last girl lydia she has kind of brought, uh, brought herself up by herself and she is very fond of pedantry pedantry what is pedantry showing off knowledge okay as opposed to real learn okay so she likes to show off her knowledge uh, show off her skills uh, as opposed to real learn so think these are the characters okay uh, that <clears throat> parental influence on people's character is shown here Mr Bennet is guilty of neglecting his daughters while Mrs Bennet's influence is not beneficial so basically uh, parental influence is not something that has really worked for these girls right while the father uh, has sort of neglected his uh, daughters uh, Mrs Bennet's influence is mostly you know on a superficial level and we cannot say that uh, her influence has strengthened the characters of her daughters so parental influence is kind of negligible you can say then the novel stand on the nature versus nurture question remains deliberately ambiguous in order to avoid any easy moralizing so it, it it's uh, not very clearly delineated okay what is it is it nature versus nurture then the inescapability of the family is brought out through pairs of characters where the virtues of one as a speciously close to the vices of the other elizabeth's frankness lydia's coarseness jane's sweetness mary's moralism darcy's superiority and his aunt's arrogance 
So they, these are in contrast with each other. Jane's chief purpose in the novel, Elizabeth's sister Jane, is an exemplary one. Okay, she is like a foil to set up the character of Elizabeth in a society where she could have flaunted her beauty. She refrains from doing so. She she was very beautiful, almost perfect, you know, but she does not boast about it. She doesn't flaunt it, thereby providing a foil for Elizabeth and Darcy's pride and prejudice and their overcoming of. So always there are characters, you know, the uh, main characters, uh, and there are the secondary characters who kind of act as foil for the other. What is a foil? What is a foil? A cover, a kind of false cover. You're not showing the real uh, picture. Yes, yeah, so kind of something that you know uh, sets. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, sets forward the beauties of the other. Like, for example, when you buy jewelry, right, you get it in a velvet box, right, which brings out the shine and beauty of the jewel that you're buying, right. So that velvet cover in which you buy the jewelry can be almost like a foil that acts as something that highlights the beauty of what you're buying. So here, uh, Jane's uh, character is something that acts as a foil for the character of Elizabeth and Darcy. They understand their pride and prejudice through uh, the contrast of Jane's character. So that is the foil there. You find this uh, same thing uh, in also the plays of Shakespeare, okay? where uh, a, a character acts as a foil for the main character. The gender and character in Pride and Prejudice. Now, masculine and feminine are used in the much wider sense of a set of cultural norms, codes of behavior, and ways of self-construction. So the male and female here refer to sex, and masculine and feminine to gender. Uh, you, we have, I think, in the last class already uh, discussed, right? Uh, sex is something which is biological, gender is constructed. Women are expected in the society to be, or at least pretend to be, delicate, helpless, and incapable of intellectual activity on the same level as men, because that is what is expected, right? The dictates of society expects women to be kind of, you know, damsels in distress, waiting for men to protect them and help them. But Jane Austen does not present any simplistic picture of women as victims. She criticizes how women gain control through manipulation, hypocrisy, and a rationing of affection. So the women uh, are not as, like, you know, helpless creatures as is portrayed by popular novels. They do have their own ways of, uh, you know, balancing the power equations uh, in different ways, maybe through manipulation, maybe through hypocrisy, maybe through rationing of affection. So Jane Austen does present this power equation in that way. The metaphor of performance is another thing that runs through the portrayal of both people's actual behavior and of the societal norm. So there is a performative element uh, with, you know, what one wants to do versus what one is expected of by the society. Now, Darcy, for example, suffers because of his inability to play to strangers, while Wickham benefits from his talent of doing just that. Wickham is able to play to strangers' tunes to make an impression on them. And Darcy is quite incapacitated in that respect. He does not uh, bow down to what is expected of him by anyone. So there is a conflict between the public versus for inner personality, right? So what, what one shows one is versus what one is real. So that metaphor of performance runs through in this novel. The dichotomy in reason versus emotion is reflected in the attitude that reading and writing of novels are seen as essential female activity. But this was primarily seen, writing of novels at that time was primarily seen as women's activity. So uh, you also find, because novels uh, brought out emotions, okay? So reason versus uh, emotion, that uh, contradiction is. Uh, reflected in this attitude that, you know, reading and writing of especially fiction was seen as something uh, for women to do. Okay? They had the idea that women are more emotional and less rational than men. But if a woman like Jane feels deeply, so does a man like Darcy. 
both show less than they feel and emotion cannot really be seen in the novel as in any way a feminine preserves okay so emotion does not uh, belong only to women men are also emotional and uh, uh, for example uh, dasi is a very emotional human being only thing is he does not show it as much as any other person does elizabeth bennet the female main female character in pride and prejudice is characterized by wit independence and a courageous ability to admit her mistakes and elizabeth's refusal of mr collins proposal jane austen is placing before us two opposing ways of looking at women one of these is the ability to attract men as a defining characteristic of femininity while the other mocks this and argues instead for women to be seen as rational and autonomous human beings so uh, elizabeth refuses collins right but uh, i mean any other girl in her position might have accepted because that would have given her social security and uh, right to her father's property but jane austen by making elizabeth refuse the proposal of mr collins kind of you know presents to us Uh, a character a woman character as a rational and autonomous human being who is able to take her own decisions then uh, i mean th there is another set of women who think that you know the ability to attract a man is uh, a an aspect of their femininity but uh, elizabeth is not like that Elizabeth's asking Mr Collins to see her as a rational creature instead of an elegant female is the best example for that. Then going to the narrative of pride and prejudice. Okay, a question of narration. How is it narrated? A narrative in its most basic sense means telling of a story or the recounting of events in a certain sequence. Narrative is located in time and the telling of the story presupposes the presence of a teller, right? if a work of fiction is a story there is someone who is telling us the story right so uh, a point of time based on which the teller of the story is narrating it to us the story could be fictional that is to say invented or factual dealing with events in the real world a narrative means that it has a beginning and an end and that the events are in an order provided by the structure of the text or by a plot Uh, what is the difference between uh, you know a, a plot and a theme? May, let me ask you: What is the theme of *Pride and Prejudice*? In one word, if you have to say. Marriage. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Love. Okay. Is it love? love yes love is love is the theme right uh, but if i were to talk about the plot how would i describe setting of the story you would give okay. a brief summary of it hmm? you would give a brief summary of it from what exactly i would have to give a brief summary for imagine you know you went to watch a film okay movie and you're going to um, meet your friend the next day and you want to tell the story to your friend right you will be narrating the plot right and how would you narrate the plot first this happened then this happened and then that happened and finally this happened you got me right so what happens first what happens after that what happens later on and finally what happens when we narrate that this becomes the plot of that story right but the universal emotion the universal truth that we take away from a story a film or whatever you name it okay a play or whatever that is the theme of uh, the book that the text that we are reading whether it's fiction whether it is a play whether it's a film right uh, the themes can be universal like love jealousy hate fear revenge all of these are themes okay so going back to the plot so a plot actually has a beginning and an end and the events in between that reach that take, takes us to the end by plot is meant the order in which the events are presented by the narrator an important aspect of narration is difference between telling and showing 
in creative writing you know where, uh, often the advice given to writers is that show don't tell what does that mean if i tell you something okay uh, that you know she was a bad girl okay imagine okay she was a bad girl or she was a good girl let's take a good example okay she was a good girl okay i'm telling you i suppose i'm the writer and i'm telling you she was a good girl versus i'm showing this girl character uh, maybe helping someone in need maybe taking care of sick people i would still be telling you she's a good girl but i'm not telling you but i would be showing you which would be more effective showing showing, showing. showing right so you understood now the difference between telling and showing right so an important aspect of narration is difference between telling and showing the terms for these uh, are respectively digesis which means description of actions by an authorial narrator and mimesis mimesis is representation of action through the imitated speech of characters so digesis and mimesis so this uh, is the difference between telling and showing so drama is pure mimesis the epic and the novel combines the two modes drama is pure mimesis because there is no authorial narration there right it's all in the form of the di dialogues and action happening on stage so it's pure mimesis and epic and novel forms combine both the modes both authorial narration and also uh, presenting to us the characters through mimesis So digesis and mimesis both present in uh, fiction and also in uh, forms like the epic. And Jane Austen tends towards a dominantly mimetic method, so showing more than telling. Okay. Going to the next topic, treatment of time in uh, Pride and Prejudice. Okay, treatment of time, process time, or the time that exists. to demonstrate a process but that's the growth of a hero that is called process time so time you can see in my slide it's divided into process time barrier time retrospective time poly temporal time so process time is a time that is taken to demonstrate the process of growth of a hero barrier time or time that is meaningful only with reference to a particular event for example the time before and after the murder in the crime story that is called as barrier time uh, that that is a time which is relevant only with reference to a particular event okay before meeting a certain character and after meeting a certain character so that is something like a barrier time then retrospective time which draws meaning by comparison with past time this is how it used to be but not now right so this is by drawing comparison with past time retrospective time poly temporal time which is a combination of all the others so there you have process time and barrier time and retrospective time combined which is a poly temporal time temporal connected with time uh, as far as the sequence of events is concerned Jane Austen's narratives rarely deviate from chronological order. Okay, so what is chronological order? And the same time that is that it appears, ma'am, without going back, just moving forward. Exactly, moving forward. Okay, suppose you uh, like you know, I uh, you are asked to write a timeline, okay, of your own life. How will you start from the time you were born, right? point of beginning would be the time you were born right and then moving forward on a linear line to the present moment you understand right yes ma'am so some, some yes, novels move like that but it's not necessary that novels have to move like that okay they can jump back in time they can jump forward in time they can have all of these combinations also so that is what we basically talking about so in jane austen's narrative Uh, mostly it is in chronological order the main action of a novel never occupies more than a year okay so straight forward uh, narration taking up uh, not more than a year so it, it's not like going back into time for example the, the next novel that we will be studying next week would be wuthering heights where we will be talking about you know time over decades the incidents happening over decades so a lot of time will be covered in that novel but here this is what we uh, 
what happens within the span of a time of of one, of one year another feature of narrative whether or not a particular narrative is capable of irony in its form uh, the definition of irony as a literary device is a situation in which there is a contrast between expectation and reality so what is expected versus what really turns out okay there is a con contrast or there is a kind of a, a surprise uh, in that okay so that is termed as uh, irony irony as a literary device uh, for example uh, there is this uh, drama called oedipus i don't know whether you have heard this greek drama it's one of the world classics okay called oedipus uh, in that you know uh, oedipus is uh, uh, when oedipus the prince is born Uh, his parents hear a prediction regarding their newborn child that he is fated to kill his father and marry his mother so this is a terrible prediction and uh, oedipus father and mother uh, decide to get rid of the baby and they give the baby to someone uh, in their court and ask uh, him to go and kill this baby but that man does not have the heart to kill his baby and he uh, gives it to a shepherd who brings up the he gives it to a shepherd who gives it to the king of a nearby province where he grows up as a prince okay and when oedipus grows up he listens to this uh, prediction he goes to an oracle the greeks were very uh, i mean very interested in going to oracles and listening to predictions about them so some oracles and when he goes to an oracle he will he listens to a prediction that he is fated to kill his father and marry his mother so he does not know that he is an adopted son of uh, his current parents and he feels uh, very unhappy about his forecast and he decides to leave home and he goes away from uh, the place where he was uh, living at that point and on the way from that place he meets another uh, person coming on the same path on a chariot and they have a fight with each other and he kills this man coming in a chariot he goes forward and he reaches a city and there uh, uh, a lot of things happen and he marries the widowed queen in that city okay and he lives there he lives there he has uh, the two daughters and a son with that lady and he lives there and Uh, after many years there is a plague and pestilence in the city of thebes and then they send out people again to oracles to find out what is wrong and the oracle they come back saying that the murderer of this widowed queen that uh, oedipus marries uh, so they they come back these people from the oracle come back come come back and they say that the murderer of the original king must be found and punished only then will the plague and pestilence go away from the land so by that time oedipus is the king of that land and oedipus uh, declares you know a, a proclamation that uh, whoever is the killer of the previous king must come forward uh, or if anybody is uh, hiding uh, or giving support to this murderer they will be punished he makes a big proclamation to all the subjects of his land later on uh, we come to know in the story that the man that oedipus killed while he was coming to thebes okay uh, this old man who was in the chariot was actually the previous king and oedipus was the murderer of this previous king okay oedipus himself was the murderer so the proclamation that he says with the intention of finding out the true murderer comes back upon himself that is a perfect example of irony do you understand me yes so yes, there is a big expectation from what is said and there is such a big contrast with the reality right so that is uh, the best example that i can give you for irony there okay the story continues okay it's a very interesting story if you want to hear i'll tell you the rest in rest some other day or if you are too interested you should go to the internet and read up the whole story is anyone familiar with oedipus yes, yes. ma'am okay good then it's fine okay. it's uh, it's from this story sigmund freud came with the oedipus complex theory right oedipus complex yes, yes. 
Yes. Good. Right. Yes. All right. So going on. Huh? So now you understood what is irony, right? Okay. That is a simple yes. uh, explanation for the word irony. Okay. Now uh, another uh, you know feature of the narrative is peripetia. That is another. Again, another Greek term. Okay, peripety is a reversal from one state of affairs to its opposite. So, some element in the plot affects a reversal. So, the hero who thought he was in good shape suddenly finds that all is lost, or vice versa. See, again, I let me take Oedipus as an example. Now, the uh, uh, Oedipus who thought of himself as a good and just king suddenly finds that everything is reversed, and he is in fact the murderer of the previous king. Who also was his real father, biological father. So everything is reversed. So peripetia is the best. Uh, the word for that, okay, the critical word for that is peripetia. The literary term for that is peripetia, reversal, reversal of state of affairs. And anagnosis is the next one. You know, anagnosis is the recognition of peripetia. The understanding of the reversal is anagnosis. The understanding of how things have changed. The change from ignorance to knowledge that is anagnosis. These are all elements that are used by writers in their narrative narration. Now here we have understanding of uh, reversal and understanding of truth. See when Elizabeth reads Darcy's letter, she understands the truth that Wickham was in fact lying, and Darcy does not have hard feelings towards her. That is when the whole story changes. So uh, elements of narration and the novel. Now I'm coming to the next one. Narrative techniques, okay, in Pride and Prejudice. Now, Jane Austen incorporates elements of uh, sentimental novel and comedy of manners into the method of realism. That is, she gives importance to emotions and sentiments and creates social world of the time. Then Pride and Prejudice comes closest to the form of the classic love story, though the required delay is caused by the lover's mistaken first impression rather than by external obstacles like for example if you take julia romeo and juliet right the obstacles caused in the love of romeo and juliet is external obstacles the fight between the two families but here the obstacles caused in the path of love of elizabeth and darcy is the lovers first in mistaken first impressions of each other the three of the principal sources of interest in narrative are suspense, mystery, and irony. The first raises the question, what will happen? Mystery raises the question, why did this happen? And irony is created when the reader knows the answers to questions, but the characters do not. There is irony, right? Like, um, for example, you know, like people who go to, uh, maybe if, if you have watched a film, okay, more than once, maybe Drishyam, okay? You watched it more than once. You know the suspense and you know everything. You know what is going to happen in the next scene, right? You know everything. But the characters on the screen, they act as if they do not know what's going to happen next, right? So there is irony in that. When we as uh, readers or we as viewers know what's going to happen, whereas the characters who are actually acting it out uh, do not know what is going to happen. So there is irony there also. Then, focalizing of action through an individual viewpoint. The chosen viewpoint in Pride and Prejudice is Elizabeth. She is the one who is talking to us. She, it is through her eyes that we are seeing the world. Thus, the reader is allowed to see Darcy only as she sees it and is as surprised as she is by the gradual revelation of her misconception of him and thereby creating the suspense. So these elements in a novel, you know, they are brought out, the three elements in the novel, suspense, mystery, and irony. So suspense is brought out because we see the character of Darcy through the eyes of Elizabeth, and when the truth about Darcy is revealed, we are as much surprised as she is. Sometimes only a few key words of a particular character in a scene or conversation connects it with the collective opinion. For example, the novel's opening sentence shows up not just uh, Mrs. Bennett's idea about marriage, but societies at large. First sentence of the novel. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. So this is the way in which this novel begins. Okay, And what happens is that, see, the uh, it is something, this, this uh, sentence spoken by Mrs. Bennett, 
okay it is something that connects uh, the reader of that story with the general prevalent opinion at that point so uh, immediately it strikes a sense of you know um, uh, relatedness when the reader is reading it then action in these novels is social interaction okay uh, it it's not adventurous action or anything it is social action and it takes place at balls and dinners and walks and parties and excursions and curtsy calls so this is the kind of action that jane austen describes in her novels such events or gatherings as these lend themselves to mimetic presentation we already discussed what is mimesis so mimetic presentation showing us what is happening with an emphasis on manners and conversation so we actually get to see how society existed uh, during that time and how people interacted with each other so the action that you see in this narration is mostly social interaction the next point here is the use of wit and irony now wit and the witty use of language are understood as a means of attaining some sort of power by characters who would otherwise not have had it okay especially elizabeth you know elizabeth uses her wit to hold her own against darcy uh, darcy is uh, darcy has all the advantages of being born in a big, uh, in a superior family superior social status and wealth and all that uh, elizabeth does not have these advantages but she has the advantage of using her wit wit means which doesn't mean she cracks jokes okay this means she talks intelligently using her common sense okay yeah. this is a, also one of the ways elizabeth manages to retain her self possession and autonomy in the face of marriage to a social superior so she is well spoken she has a mind of her own she is intelligent that is the meaning of the word wit okay so uh, this is what she used in order to find or uh, have her own identity even though she is marrying someone far superior to her own so uh, someone has uh, unmuted their microphone can you mute it please you okay. take a microphone okay uh, mute it please otherwise others will not be able to hear me clearly okay. uh, carrying on uses it as self defense and conversation with lady catherine so lady catherine de bourg who was very rude to elizabeth and elizabeth does not have anything else for defense other than her strong wit uh, lady catherine comments on her poor upbringing background etc and elizabeth uses her wit to give her a right answer wit and irony are seen as personal attributes but in mr bennet's case irony also becomes escapism and a shrugging off of responsibility with wit irony uh, sarcasm for which he is clearly accountable so what did we already read about mr bennet the father he was very uh, he was withdrawn wise. right he wise was all on kind of a recluse right he, he was uh, uh, not a parent who was very involved in the bringing of his children right uh, but and he whenever he is faced Uh, with giving an answer to the questions of Mrs. Bennet, he usually tries to escape with uh, irony, some sort of ironical comment he makes, uh, and he, that is how he uh, shrugs off his responsibility, uh, and uh, that is how it, he is presented as a character who uses wit and irony and sarcasm to uh, shrug out of responsibility thrust upon him by Mrs. Bennet. and mr <coughs> mr bennet is amused when jane is deserted by bingley although it doesn't seem fair to jane at one point jane is deserted by bingley and mr jane seems to be amused by uh, that happening irony is thus a double awareness produced by the reader's simultaneous access to the point of view of the character and that of the narrator so uh, uh, in a way you know it doesn't seem fair to jane but in the uh, larger course of things we know that you know even being deserted by dingley is not such a hindrance actually and that is a point of view of the father so there uh, we uh, we readers have the simultaneous access to the point of view of the characters and that of the narrator that is what jane austen seems to be showing that you know there is another side to this whole thing yeah, and you can take it with a, a, a pinch of wit and 
irony in it so it also has a corrective purpose okay bit used in order to bring out the faults in society that is what we call as satire so satire bases itself upon this aspect of wit and irony is a way out for a character who cannot show open content for society ironical uh, uh, comments made by uh, elizabeth uh, when she is rejected by darcy at the ball satire diminishes a character and is meant to act as a corrective while irony shows resignation on the part of the novelist or the character who longs for change but knows that it's not going to happen so mr bennett's irony is of this kind so uh, irony can depict itself in two ways okay one is where the uh, irony shows resignation okay i might pass ironic statements i might pass almost sarcastic statements but it's not going to change the state of affairs uh, the other is where satire is used wit in the form of satire is used to correct the mistakes and faults in a person or a society now mr bennett's uh, irony is of the first kind where you know uh, he knows that no matter what he says uh, mrs bennett uh, running to find the suitable boys for her daughters that's not going to change the way society exists at that uh, time it's not going to change so mr bennett's irony is of the resigned kind so use of irony and this in the novel the next topic is uh, feminist approach in the novel so problem areas for feminist criticism of jane austen first one ignoring of sexual activity the stress is on the absence of female sexuality and the female body <clears throat> i mean the women characters uh, do not actually claim their sexuality so that is one of the criticisms leveled against the writing of jane austen then apparent political conservatism Uh, read as an implicit acceptance of the dominant patriarchal ideology so uh, politically she presents a more conser- conservative opinion uh, uh, in, through her characters and through her stories through her fiction so this kind of uh, you know the critics kind of level uh, the accusation against uh, jane austen that she uh, she kind of it was supports or there is an implicit acceptance of a dominant patriarchal ideology in the way in which uh, her political conservatism is shown through the novels okay dominant patriarchal ideology the superiority of that current political ideology the term female and feminine biological versus Uh, cultural now we have to understand what that is okay there is this uh, critic called elaine showalter who uses these terms differently in the area of women's writing especially feminist writing elaine showalter one of the uh, precursors in this area of writing in a literature of their own in 1982 she sh- suggests that feminine stage of women's writing involves a period when the prevalent dominant standards and traditions are imitated and internalized okay so uh, in a feminine uh, stage that that those are the different stages she uh, defines it into different stages uh, the area of women's writing so the f- feminine stage is the first one where the prevalent and dominant uh, standards of writing standards and traditions of writing are imitated and internalized first stage then we have the feminist stage of women's writing which involves an emphasis on the rights and values of the minority as well as valorization of their difference so a feminine stage and feminist stage so in the feminist stage the values of the minority for example i mean in this case the women here okay women as minority women as having lesser rights than the men Uh, so their rights are valorized valorized means given importance to uh, valor is courage so valorization so given highlight then we have the female stage uh, that is a stage of self discovery and establishment of a separate and distinct identity so feminine stage feminist stage and the female stage so the, this is how elaine showalter uh, differentiates you know uh, different areas of women's writing 
<clears throat> then uh, Jane Austen has been accused of restricting women to domesticity in her fiction because she appears to leave out politics and religion almost completely. Feminism seeks to explain the history of subordination and marginalization of women and to show that values like reason are not universal ones, but those of man at a certain point in history. So uh, the accusation leveled against Jane Austen is that, again, she shows women in domestic situations. Okay, so she has kind of, you know, uh, reduced women uh, to the area of domesticity in her fiction because politics and religion is almost left out. But then, see, feminism explains the history of subordination and marginalization of women and tells us that, you know, the, the uh, predominant or the prevalent, uh, uh, prevalent ideas at any point in time are those of a man because they were the ones who were allowed to have a voice. And they, it is their voice that speaks to, speaks to us at any given time. Then feminist criticism also looks at the ways in which women are stereotyped and constrained by patriarchal society. So it questions the implicit male bias of historical theory. Uh, history only deals with the public area of political conflict or of the market, the conception of the heroic linked to empires, wars, and the notions of progress. And so when we say history, you know, uh, history is something which is basically uh, uh, narrated from a very male perspective in the sense that when we talk about history, we talk about uh, the public area of political conflict, okay, which is very public, you know, political conflict. You talk about market, you talk about conception of the heroic, when you talk about heroic, it is always connected with empires and wars and battles, etc. Right, and that is how we connect uh, with the notion of progress. But suppose history was going to be narrated by a woman, how would that be? Right, uh, uh, see, a woman would never narrate uh, about a war in glorious terms, right? Because a war to a woman is where she loses her. Uh, husbands, brothers, and sons, right? So th this is not something to be proud of, right? So a woman looking at history would be entirely different from how history is viewed by men who are narrators. And the voice reaching us through history is, is those of, you know, voices reaching us through history are those of men, very less about women. So if history is supposed to demonstrate eternal truths about human nature and conduct, women's history cannot be ignored. War is not always necessarily a noble subject to women who have to cope with laws and pain it brings, not the glory of battle. So women's history also draws parallels between the domestic and the military experience. Not only married couples like the Bennets, but also people in love like Dar Elizabeth and Darcy, their interaction often begins to look like a battlefield. Uh, relationships are actually uh, power battles in, in many instances, right? So here also you find Elizabeth and Darcy in their relationship beginning to look like a power battlefield, right? So, uh, I mean, there can be like a connection between a domestic relationship and a military relationship, right? In the sense that there are battles fought, uh, only one is uh, one is both are about power actually, you know. But one is between two individuals, there are the other is between more like nations. Uh, Jane Austen uh, presents a microcosmic, uh, you know, world details of daily social life as an embodiment of the codes and standards and proprieties of the community. On the whole, a sound education and learning is advocated for women in Jane Austen's story. So uh, we can actually sum up by saying that uh, uh, as far as Austen's schools are concerned, what she's advocating is education, financial independence, and learning uh, for the freedom of women, for women to be truly emancipated. So uh, that is a feminist reading of uh, the novel. Okay, we're coming to the post-colonial readings. Because in all your uh, novels, you know, there are these various readings. 
by the way like do you know what i mean when i say readings you can read a novel right and you read it and you understand the story but what do these various readings mean like for example i can have a psychological reading i can have a feminist reading i can have a post colonial reading or a marxist reading what do these readings mean what do these readings mean? can anyone tell me? Come on. Interpretations, ma'am. Different interpretations. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Interpretation. So a, a text can be read uh, like a story from beginning to the end. But then you can ask students of literature. We are not just going to read a story. We will be analyzing it, right? Uh, especially given the developments, right? Like of uh, feminist reading. Uh, as time has passed, right? We are not uh, living in the same age as uh, Jane Austen lived. so we are able to give a feminist reading of her book in in the light of the current feminist theory available to us or uh, post colonial reading is what we're going to do next okay so based on imperialism and whatever was existence at that point in time and how we look at it now so we can have a post colonial reading also okay? post colonial criticism and theory deals with broadly the social political cultural and economic practices which arise in response or in resistance to colonialism and in imperialism so uh, the the you know everything that comes up in society comes up in life uh, in response to colonialism uh, and imperialism or in resistance to colonialism and imperialism so that is post colonial criticism how do we react to that in austen's novels empire is not as obvious a concern uh, as it is in later fiction like that of kipling and conrad conrad we'll be studying conrad in conrad the empire or the colonies are very much present there and very much uh, required in the understanding of the novel but uh, austen's novel is set in uh, within uh, you know that village and uh, the the location is mostly or the setting is mostly in the interiors of homes so we are not so much uh, obviously thrust into a colonial uh, environment said reading of austen the english novel unwittingly but systematically helped to gain consent for imperialist policies so say that word say this uh, a prominent critic of uh, col colonialism and post colonialism Uh, and he says see the english novel unwittingly set the stage for or like implicit provisions for imperialist policy the novels were say the third one of the primary discourses contributing to a consolidated vision virtually and un uncontested of england's rightiest imperial prerogative through the novel zero you know, kind of sanction was given by the writers Uh, of the english to have their own imperialistic tendencies or imperialistic uh, prerogatives were rightiest that sort of permission was gained through these fictions and austen's construction of the west as center home and norm makes colonialism thinkable uh, so uh, the west is seen as the home and the center and uh, when it's seen as the home and center everything else becomes the other becomes something separate and different and that is how the whole system of colonialism uh, sprang up right i mean every other nation the westerners thought every other nation and every other place was theirs for taking for so theirs for subjugating ruling and taking control of that's the whole premise for uh, the whole imperialistic enterprise but seed fails to notice how her position as a woman of spinster and a writer marginalizes her and allows her voice uh, allows her to voice with irony the experience of exile from at least some societal norms so uh, we can counter what seed has said seed said that you know the uh, fiction uh, especially in the domestic form like how jane austen writes uh, is something that implicitly seems to uh seems to uh, you know kind of 
uh, kind of give permission or give validation to uh, England's imperialistic uh, agenda. That is what Said said. But we can counter what Said said by saying that her position, Jane Austen's position as a woman, as a, a female writer, uh, naturally exiles her from um, most of the societal norms with, with which imperialism can be associated. So as a woman writer, as a spinster, as an unmarried woman writer, uh, all of these are uh, elements of the writer that kind of makes her the voice of one who is marginalized, one of the minorities. So she is writing from the perspective of maybe a colonized nation, one of the minorities, one of the marginalized. So her voice is that of, you know, the people from the colonized countries in that sense, if you look at it. Now, many Indian students, while reading Austin's novels, draw parallels between her society and theirs, citing as common factors the rigid class structure, the restrictions placed upon women, and the emphasis on surface appearances. So this is how we can find, uh, as people from a post-colonial uh, country, right? we can understand when we read Jane Austen's novel and the limitations that her women characters have to face to get by in their day-to-day -day life. We as women can relate with that because we still are dealing with a lot of these issues. Uh, parallels between our society and theirs. Uh, for example, rigid uh, class structure, restrictions placed upon women, and the emphasis on surface appearances. All of these are things that women in this post-colonial country are still facing. So we can counter what Sayed has said, rather. Okay? Is it clear to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, now we're going to, I think this is the last slide. I have already taken up a lot of your time. This is the last slide, the Marxist in interpretation of uh, Austin's work. Okay? Now, what is Marxist criticism? See, it focuses on the material conditions in and around the text, which would include conditions of its production and the issues of class and labor, uh, both as they appear in the text and in its production. Uh, Marxist thought leads to analysis of the relation of exploitation and domination. Uh, Marxist theory, we talk about uh, conditions of production, labor, and exploitation. All of these things come into Marxist uh, literary theory. So uh, when you look at conditions of production, okay, the issues of class and labor and how it is uh, presented in the text, now when you, need, uh, when you uh, look at that, you know, it leads to analysis of the relation between exploitation and domination. Uh, which is something that uh, is that is that all societies have to deal with. Now, Marxist readings of fictional texts also require that attention be paid to the role of money in the text, uh, how the characters' lives are determined by their class and economic status, and social history of the landed families is central and structural in Jane Austen's novel. And uh, her work also highlights differences between life in the town and that in the country. Uh, the country in these novels has its share of hardship. She doesn't uh, adhere to the contemporary stereotype, at least in literature, uh, of the country uh, life as being something idyllic, you know, something harmonious and contented in contrast to the city as being deceptive and inhospitable. So uh, she presents to us, you know, that uh, the, the country life is also not an easy one. Then there are examples from Pride and Prejudice where the town or country divide comes up as a comment on the thoughts and values and the varying degrees of social snobbery of the characters. So these uh, sisters of Darcy, uh, yes, no, the sisters of Bingley, all of these girls coming from the city seem to be more snobbish than people in the uh, village, right? So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that life in the village is easier, okay? Life in the village is uh, tough and uh, Jane Austen makes no pretense about that. Then, though Jane makes no direct correlation between material means of possessions and gentility, listening to Darcy's housekeeper praising him is important in changing her opinion of it. 
so uh, elizabeth uh, changes her opinion of darcy when she uh, listens to darcy's housekeeper so a housekeeper remember from the labor class so uh, when she praises darcy and uh, talks about darcy's kindness that is what moves elizabeth to change her opinion of darcy makes her more uh, uh, more positive in her attitude towards darcy so we uh, do find that you know jane austen does not uh, uh, it does not connect uh, possessions with gentility it, it doesn't mean that uh, rich people are uh, gentle people or rich people are better people it's not like that in jane austen's novels and the example is how uh, elizabeth's opinion of darcy is changed through the words of the housekeeper rather than anything else then uh, marx's criticism makes us look at how pride and prejudice was published it being refused by a publisher in 19 uh, in 1797 to be accepted for publication only 15 years later in 1812 so 15 years uh, as a woman and as a writer she had to keep her manuscript with her until it found the light of day so uh, in terms of marxist criticism uh, that is important right how a work has to wait for that many years for it to find the right uh, right soil to grow in so marxist criticism of the work looks at all these aspects and that's the last uh, slide in this uh, novel and uh, um, from what i was reading uh, regarding uh, the novel it's a very important novel in all the novels prescribed to you for study and it would uh, most often be Uh, you know one from which questions are asked for the exam so uh, keep that in mind when you study this and uh, following this uh, i in the group i will try to send you uh, films oh by the way there is a bollywood film also made based on this novel except it's not called pride and prejudice it's called bride and uh, prejudice I, i don't know have you watched it yes sir we have Yeah, yes, may, you may have right some of you at least might yes, have sir. watched it right yeah so others also you, you can i'm sure it's available uh, on um, on the internet right so you can uh, maybe you know try uh, watching it it might help you in studying uh, you know uh, the novel so um, but it doesn't come closer to any of the original version of it Yeah, they have changed this setting. I was just trying to make it. In, 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 I mean, there would be the English film versions also available. Okay, in case you are interested, uh, there would be the English film versions also available. But if you want to watch a Bollywood film with Aishwarya Rai and the rest, we can try watching that also. It's your choice. Okay, uh, and I'll uh, send you uh, this PowerPoint also uh, very soon. I'll send that also to you. Okay, so uh, shall I uh, shall I call it a day? Is there anything that anyone wants to ask me? I stopped sharing my screen, and uh, if there is any questions that you want to ask, you can ask it. Uh, otherwise, and we can end the session and uh, continue next Saturday. Uh, ma'am how can i get myself added in the group i am actually from delhi and somebody shared the uh, link of your class in my group and uh, i just wanted to attend your class uh, um, in future also i think also. the link is uh, um, uh, how do you join uh, can I'm someone some tell her how to join yes. the group Ma'am, also I want this PowerPoint uh, slides. Uh. Yeah, I I've been sending the PowerPoint things on the uh, on the group. Ma'am, I want to get is... myself added in that group only. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, like there is a group invite. Or... I I think somebody can share the group invite here. Can anyone who's already here share the group invite here? I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, so. someone please please share group invite 
yeah you can i just you know try to get the number of uh, someone uh, and you can share the group in by uh ma'am i have uh, written it in the comment box let's see if somebody will uh, add me yeah yeah you can do that uh, is anyone there here who can share the group invite nobody is responding <laughs> uh, okay you know what i'll do uh, i can give you my number and uh, i'll see if i can add or or i'll send you the group invite i think uh, okay ma'am uh, okay ma'am uh, should i uh, give my number uh, i i just uh, you can write down my number i'll just uh, say that no i am also uh, writing mine uh okay you can write down my i'm just going to say it aloud you can write yes, it down yes okay? please please yeah, ma'am 97 yes ma'am 460 460 32 32 702 702 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 